Hey, welcome to Creative Block. We're your host, Gene. And V, we interview people in creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while we do Dole Jam. We ask people on Twitter if they had specific topics they want us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. And today with us, we have Eric Robles. Hi. Hi. Hello. How are you guys? <laughs> We're doing great. Uh, our listeners can't see this, but this is our first episode where we actually keep our video up. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm I'm a visual person, guys. I get it. I totally get it. I need to yeah. I need to feel the connection. Yeah, is all, the, the conversation. You know? Yes, but for me, for me, this is a new this is a new one because I'm <laughs> I'm always like a gremlin that like only has to focus on his voice. I'm, um, I'm, I'm totally need that connection, and I'm I, if I throw you guys off, I'm sorry, but I need no that no connection. no. It'll be totally fine. You're just gonna yeah. see the side of my head drawing most of the time. But uh, yeah, Eric, tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, yeah, first, you know, because I've been watching your guys' show, I'm going to give um, uh, props to Clemens for editing all the stuff that you yeah. guys do. Yeah. Because, you know, at the, at the end of these things, I'm all, you know, I hear you guys give props, but let's give her props, yeah. guys. Let's do this, right? Yeah. Let's uh, get a little. Yeah. <laughs> Shout uh, out, so, Clem. So, yeah, I've been listening to you guys for a long while now, so I'm a big fan of Thank what you. you guys are doing. Um all right, who the hell am I? Uh, I am Eric Robles, and I am, let's see, how do I put this? I'm a survivor of two drive-by shootings, uh, five-time oh, Emmy Award winning. Oh, wait, is that throwing <gasps> you guys off? Uh, no, that's a good that's a start. Okay. I love yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we'll get into that, yeah. So uh, five-time Emmy Award winning creator of Fanboy and Chum Chum and uh, co-creator of Netflix's Glitch Text. Uh, that's me. In a nutshell, <laughs> where do you guys want to begin with that one? That was loaded, the, right? The drive-by <laughs> shootings. Let's start with that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, look, born and raised in LA, uh, you know, my parents are, they're immigrants uh, to this country in the 70s. And um, they, they were, you know, they didn't have money at all. Like my mom came to this country with like 300 bucks, I think, and like two... Wow. Out wearing two outfits, uh, you know, coming to this country. My dad um, had, I think, uh, in total 10 siblings, and everybody kind of made their their way into this country in different trips and rounds um, yeah. with absolutely no money. You know, it's just how we grew up. But uh, I'm not going to sing you guys a song about it, how sad it was, because I didn't even realize it. We were just happy as a family, right? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. but we definitely didn't have a lot of the perks, I guess, you know, uh, that a lot of other kids had, but again, didn't realize it. I was a kid. So what did it matter? Um, but growing up in those environments, you know, you grow up around a lot of, uh, uh, gangs and the gang life is definitely part of it. I have a lot of family members that were really involved in gangs and, uh, went to prison and uncles, you know, like it's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of that kind of stuff. But we never saw it as like negative. It's just life. And that's just how we grew up. And so we kind of just embraced it all. And gang members weren't gang members in the sense of like bad guys. They were friends and family. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it just felt felt like family. And that's a big part of my life is not only family, but like when we talk about crews, I take it real personal. I'm like, you know, these are like, this is my crew, right? So there's like a, a whole, there's a bond that's like unlike... Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how other people perceive it, but I know I take it real personal uh, in, in building my teams and my crew because I feel like they got my back and I'll have their back kind of vibe, you know. And so it's like just, a family, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, kind of grew up in that. So, you know, grew up in, in L.A. Uh, majority of my family, we all kind of like grew up in the Cypress Park area near Dodger Stadium. Um, and so, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the gangs happening there. And then my parents kept kind of like trying to uh, move my sister and my sisters and I into better school districts. So even though we would live in like rougher areas, they kind of like forge uh, like addresses to get us into better schools. So <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, I mean, that was cool, right? Uh, uh, for us and to help us in that way. But then, you know, we always went back home and then we got into trouble at home, you know, in the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. right? So little by little though, they, they eventually started moving out of the LA area into like a, a Glendale and then the Glendale school districts. And then eventually they kind of played that game for a while. So I don't have uh, many of the similar stories of, of like, oh man, you know, I knew I was going to be an artist. Uh, 
I, I definitely want to go to CalArts or, or Art Center or any of these. I didn't even know those things existed, guys. I did know that animation yeah. existed, but but you know, again, I, 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 there was no internet around that time, uh, so I would just right. wait for s- specials that. While Disney Channel would show like a not the channel itself, but they would have like a certain channels would show some behind the scenes of like yeah, how yeah. they made cartoons, and I would watch that stuff and be like, oh, that's awesome. And then I would go tell my sister, hey Jen, you know, describe what a character in your head, uh, you know, I don't know, looks like. And I would have her write stuff, and because I would see that in those uh, specials, and then she would write like a list. She, you know, he's sixty five and he's this and that, right? <laughs> And then I go back and I try to imagine what she was saying just because I saw that on TV, but I still didn't know what that was. I didn't even know what that meant. And so uh, I really got into art in junior high and started taking like just miscellaneous art classes. And then I followed through uh, with art classes in high school. Again, not knowing about a career in animation. I, I swear, I just didn't. I knew people made it, but I knew, but I also felt, I don't want to say I knew, I felt that people like us Latinos, uh, you know, didn't make that. It just, it was different, right? So that was the Mm -hmm. feeling we had. And when you grow up in these neighborhoods, we didn't have um, counselors that were like, hey, kid, you know what? You got talent. You should probably, you know, it it was just survival, the fittest kind of vibe, right? Mm -hmm. And our our Mm -hmm. parents were just struggling. They had two jobs each. So my sister and I, we, you know, we grew up as latchkey kids, right? Like uh, both of my sisters and myself, we just kind of raised ourselves while our parents were always working. So um, mm-hmm. when people ask me about fanboy and chum chum and they're like, how come they don't have parents? And I'm like, oh, I never even thought about that. It's just like, I, you know, fam- fanboy and chum chum is my childhood of growing up at 7-Elevens, you know, with my friends. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I drew a lot from that experience. So anyways, um, going to high school, uh, I, I took a lot of the art classes. And I do remember a time when there was a, an instructor that uh, the instructor, the art, art uh, instructor was um, teaching certain kids about uh, portfolios. And because I, all my friends were gang members and they would come pick me up from class, you know, Hey, fool, let's go. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I'd be like, all right. Yeah. But I just felt because I was friends with them, like there wasn't that uh, attention on, to me to say like, Hey, do you want to learn about portfolios? Cause I didn't even know what those things were. I just knew that there was a particular group of kids that were being taught that kind of uh, stuff on preparing them for college. And I think because I was friends with a different kind of group of kids that uh, this instructor didn't think I'd be interested in going to college or even art, even though that was like my jam and I loved it. So um, I, I because of that experience, though, I did ask my mom and my dad and I said, uh, if I graduate, you know, from high school, if I graduate, right, if I graduate from high school, <laughs> um, do you think I can go to like an art school? And I didn't even know what that meant. I I just put it out Mm -hmm. there. Right. And my mom was like, no, mijo, like, it's just something we can't afford. We don't even know like what, if we could send you to college, they just didn't know. They weren't educated to say like, yes or no. And, you know, my parents weren't doctors from Mexico or lawyers from Mexico. (laughs) Like, um, so she was just like, you know, I don't think we could. Right. And I was just like, okay, no big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just threw it out there. It was just a thought. So then I figured, well, I can't do this thing that I love, which is art. So I'll do the next best thing that I do know. And I know really well. And that's mm-hmm. the streets. All right. So I'm like, I'm going to be a cop. That's it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be a cop. Like, I know the streets really well. I know I know the neighborhood. I know how these guys act. I know what they're doing. I know <laughs> when they're doing it. You know, I, I knew that part of it. So I was like, I'm going to be an awesome cop because I know how to talk the talk. I know how, how this thing works. So I'm going to do this thing. And mm-hmm. so um, at the age of 17, uh, I had talked to my counselor and, uh, you know, you do your check-ins and the counselor was like, oh, look, it looks like uh, you're doing really good with your um, classes and getting all your credits. So next year, when you're going to be a senior, you don't have to come in full time. And I was like, oh. oh, okay. I was like, and he goes, yeah, by lunchtime, you could go home. And I was like, oh, okay. And and then it hit me and I was like, wait a second. If 
you're telling me I, I have enough credits technically to graduate early. I mean, isn't that what you're saying? And he's like, no, no not graduate early because you're still going to have to take these classes next year. And I'm like, yeah, but it's only like two or three classes, right? And he's like, yeah. I was like, is it possible for me to take like adult school or take extra classes and graduate early? And then he looked at me like I was crazy, right? And, mm -hmm. and I was like, and he's like, why would you want to graduate early? And I'm like, because I can start college early if I did that, right? And he looks so confused and he says, well, don't you want to graduate with all your friends on stage? I'm like, I don't care about that. I want to start my life and I want to. Yeah. <laughs> so I took like, uh, you know, I was going to school at 7 a.m. I was taking uh, adult school like at night to get extra credit um, while working like crazy jobs because a lot of my part time jobs would help my parents uh, financially, you know, to pay for all the stuff we needed as a family. And so, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I did that for, for a while and, and, and then ended up graduating technically by the age of 17 and going to a uh, community wow. college. Um, yeah, going to community college by 17. And I even had to go back to graduate on stage, even though I was already in college. <laughs> oh, okay. interesting. I mean so they yeah. still had you do it anyway. Yeah. It, was, it was all just, oh, man. Yeah, it, yeah, it was weird, right? So I did it. And uh, so I went to college, studied law enforcement for two years. Um, and then while studying law enforcement, uh, I, one of my classes was a field investigation class. And the instructor was a Burbank police officer named uh, Joe Dean, Officer Dean. And so every time, like we all do as artists, like you guys are doing, right? When somebody's talking, you're listening, but you're drawing, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you're drawing. Yep. And that's just what we do. And we, we probably all did that in school. And we would yep. get in trouble for it all the time. But, but yep. it doesn't mean we're mm -hmm. not listening. And so yep. I would take my test in Blue Book exams. And if the test was about field lineups, I would draw a bunch of thugs lined up at the end of my test, like, you know, <laughs> and just because it was fun. Right. And so I would yeah. I would turn in my tests and my instructor, uh, he loved like checking out my drawings. And then one day he's like, Robles. And I'm like, uh, yeah, he says, come here. And I was like, uh, what's the problem? Officer uh -oh. Dean? And then he's like, he's like these drawings at the back of your blue book exams. Right. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I was just doing those for fun. You know, I won't do those. And he's like, no, 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 no these drawings. I love your drawings. He's like, it makes me look forward to giving you tests. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, well, uh, I could do those without the test, sir. So <laughs> you don't have to give us tests. And then he's like, no, he's like, what are you doing in my class? Come on, kid, you know? And I'm like, well, right. what, what do you mean? And he's like, you're an artist. Like, what are you doing? Like studying law enforcement? That's cool. Uh, yeah. Right. Mm, that's and, really sweet. Yeah. And I, I was like, I, I don't I don't I don't know anything about like art. Right. I just know what I know. And I took up a couple of classes in high school. He's like, he's like, do you have a portfolio by any chance? And I was like, I'll be honest with you. I don't even know what a portfolio looks right. like. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then and he's like, I'll tell you what, if you put a sketchbook together with a bunch of cool drawings like you do all the time, I will show it to my sister in law. She works in animation. And I was like, oh my, and I want you guys to just understand the magnitude of how this felt for me, because mm -hmm. this is something I loved as a kid. I grew up on Saturday morning cartoons and cereal, right? And so animation was, it's all like, it has a really like sweet place in my heart, right? And mm -hmm. this man is telling me that he knows somebody that's connected to that magic. Mm -hmm. That's huge. That's huge. So, That's huge. For somebody who has zero connections, knows nothing, you know, grew up in the hood in that way. I'm so disconnected like that. I, I, it was a, a big deal. And so I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'll definitely do that. So I, I went to a local, uh, back then it was like a CVS type store and I got myself one of those black uh, sketchbooks, right? That we probably all have had. And I spent literally three days guys back to back like filling that thing up right like i did not sleep that weekend it was like like for sure saturday sunday monday like i did not sleep i wanted to fill this thing out because what an opportunity and i did i felt like if i didn't turn it in fast enough it, it would just vanish right and then the dude could have been like yeah uh, you could turn next month or two months from now i'll still show it to her but to me it was critical 
And so I knew I had to take advantage of that. And I did. I, I, uh, he said that his sister-in-law worked at a studio called Graz Entertainment. And so you guys understand, this is in the 90s, Graz Entertainment was like the studio. It was a studio that did the original X-Men series. They did like all those awesome Capcom, like crazy action shows. Okay. Um, Skeleton Warriors, uh, you know, Conan, like all those crazy 90s cartoons. Like this was a studio that did it. And so I went and I bought myself a bunch of uh, um, just like uh, cards and comic books that I had. And I started drawing a bunch of like the X-Men characters and filled out the entire thing. And I turned it into him. And I said, oh, Sir Dean, here it is. I'm done. You know, and he's just like just he's sweating. Like, <laughs> yeah, I had literally like probably did a bathe for three days. I'm like, here you go. And, yeah. uh, and I gave it to him and he's just like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And he went through all of it. And he's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you did this so fast. And I'm like, I just wanted to, you know, didn't want this opportunity yeah. to go away. And he just started laughing. And, um, you know, I get a call maybe about. Uh, a week later and it was a, a production person from that studio says like hey uh stephanie um you know uh joe's uh, sister-in-law really likes your work and you know if you want to come by we can give you a tour of the studio and again like one of these moments of like oh my gosh i get to actually go to an animation studio that's like crazy right and so i was like okay yeah absolutely and I was working a job as a security uh, guy at the time and, um, you know, trying to get those law enforcement credits, right? <laughs> so, yeah. um, <laughs> and, and working like my job and, and help my parents and going to school and doing all this. But yeah, here's my shot to go just visit a studio. And I went, I, I, I got the whole tour. It was amazing to like see cubicles for the first time, artists for the first time, like drawing. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And by the way, I'm 19 years old at this time, right? I was so, going to ask how old you were because, yeah, that's yeah. that's uh, that's a lot. That's a lot yeah. to be going through. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm 19 years old because I said I graduated at, you know, right. 17, right? So Got a head start. I, yeah, I was two years into college. And um, so at the age of 19, this was all happening. And then um, Carrie Silver was a production manager. He says, well, if we ever have an internship, uh, would you be interested? And I'm like, I, I would definitely take it. I would definitely take it. whatever you guys have. I will take it, you know. And he goes, OK, well, we'll see. You know, maybe around summertime, something comes up. We'll let you know. I'm like, great. He's like, in the meantime, he's like, here's the name of a friend of mine that works uh, at, at MGM Animation. Right. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I get to meet somebody else and go to another studio. Like, that's crazy. Right. I got so excited about that opportunity, too. And so I'm like, awesome, this is gonna be great. So I said, thank you so much. And I got my little sketchbook and then I reached out to the guys at MGM and they set up a meeting for me. So I was like, great, this is amazing. So MGM back then was in Santa Monica. And so I'm like, I'm going to Santa Monica, you know, so excited about that opportunity just to go to, the, to, to MGM. And I did, I remember I was so nervous. I mean, I'm 19 years old, guys. Like it's just, yeah, you that's, know. Yeah, that's young. So, the producer comes out and we're walking through the bullpen of artists. I think they were working like on All Dogs 2 or something like that. Like, you know, right. one of those features, right? And so I'm just like so enamored and just blown away by what they're doing as we're walking through. We go to his office. We have a little conversation. He asked me, you know, who I am, what I'm doing and all this stuff. And I said, um, you know, I, I grew up over here. And I told him a little bit about myself. And then I said, and he says, well, you have a portfolio? I said, no, I got my sketchbook, though, you know. And so I showed him my sketchbook. He goes through it. And then, you know, he kind of like smiles a little bit. And then he puts it on the table and gives it back to me. And, and then he kind of leans back in his chair. And he goes, all right, kid. He's like, you see those guys out there in the bullpen, right? And I'm like, yeah, those guys are my heroes, right? And I'm like, yes. He goes, unfortunately, you'll never be one of those guys. Oh, Aww. that's crazy. And I was like, oh, oh, oh OK. Man. You know, he's like, you just don't have the talent. He's like, you don't have the talent to be. So what I do recommend, since you grew up in L.A. and, you know, you know, that environment, you're going to college for law enforcement. I think you should really stick to that law enforcement kind of like career path for yourself. Right. 
Right. And I said, because, and he's, he goes, it really takes a lot of training and a lot of uh, education to, to get into this industry, right? And I said, oh, mm-hmm. okay. I said, all right. So what do I know, right? I'm just a kid, man. So uh, this guy's a producer. Like, what do I know, right? He knows his business. I don't. And so I said, okay. I said, all right. Thank you so much, sir. And I appreciate your time. And I just remember, like, of course, I was, like, heartbroken because I, I literally, for a minute there, I thought there was something going to happen here, like a little momentum, right? So I was like, okay, no problem. I'm like, how the hell this fool think he's going to tell me like that? I'm not good enough? I was like, fuck this guy, man. I was that like, fire. Dude, I was like, fire. no, 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 no. You got the wrong guy, my friend. And so I, at that moment, I was like, that's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an animator. I'm going to join this industry and I'm going to show this dude and myself and everybody else who's ever doubted me. I'm going to show them what's up. Right. So I said a hundred percent. Right. I went back and I started trying to figure out how it all worked. And then I got a call from Graz Entertainment and they said, hey, kid, we got an internship. If you're available, we could bring you in. And I was like, oh, yeah, definitely. I'm there. Oh, my gosh. This is now I'm like excited again. This is like an opportunity. I'm like, I'm back in. I'm back in. Right. So I took the uh, I took the the internship and I was like a kid in a candy store. Right. 19 years Mm -hmm. old. I'm just excited because I'm a part of this whole different world that I knew I didn't even know existed like prior to a month ago, probably. Right. And now I'm just like here and I'm going in. I was the first one there and I made my rounds to all the artists. I was like, hi, my name's Eric Robles. Um, if you need me to sharpen your pencil, I'm your guy. If you need me to you know, <laughs> go get your coffee, I'm your guy. If you need me to take out your trash, I'm your guy, right? So uh, a lot of those guys got a kick out of it. And so I did a lot of the production stuff up front and I would make copies uh, of the model sheets, right? And then I would make extra copies for myself and then you know, did my work. And I'd go home at night and I would stay up super late practicing how to draw those model sheets. So every night there I was drawing, drawing, drawing and figuring out how anatomy worked. I didn't understand anatomy. I didn't understand any of the the, the fundamentals of animation, right? So I was trying to figure all these things out without having access to certain books or what have you. But at that point, that's when one of the guys says, hey, there is a book from Stan Lee. It's called How to Draw the Marvel Way. That can teach you like some fundamentals. And so these guys were at least feeding me like, hey, you know, illusion of life, go buy that, go buy this, right? So I, I bought like my my three, four books and I started trying to figure it out. Then I would go visit Carlos Wante, you know, and I said, Carlos, you're like the guy. And then Carlos went from like, like, oh, hey, what's up, man? Thinking like it was a one-off to now he's like, nah, dude, I don't got time for you. And I was like, oh, bro, come on, man. You know, help me out here. Yeah. And, and and, and then uh, I was like, I would, I would, every day, I was persistent. I was like, hey, man, if you could just look at a couple of my drawings. He's like, no, nah, I don't got time right now. And I was like, dude, just check out a couple of my drawings the next day, right? And then he's like, I'll tell you what. I'll start looking at your drawings if you uh, go buy yourself a Bridgman book, George Bridgman, and start studying anatomy. And if you come back with 10 drawings by the end of the week, He's like, then I'll take a look at your drawings. And I was like, okay, 10 drawings, no problem. The next day, dude, I came back with 30 drawings, okay? Heck yeah. 30 drawings, right? And I'm like, bam, I dropped it. And I'm like, here's the assignment, and I'm ready, dude. Like, and then Let's he, talk. Yeah, he wanted to make sure I was worth his time. Sure. Because mm-hmm. who knows how many kids came up to him, you know, yeah, before yeah. and... And they just didn't uh, take take it serious, right? And I was like, no, you got to understand. I have zero education and I need education. I need somebody to teach me how this works, right? And mm-hmm. you're the guy who do, can help me with this, right? So he was like, okay, and started kind of showing me and dr- doing drawovers on my stuff. Or, and, and I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this, but I've never seen this before. When he would draw over my stuff, his stuff would automatically make my work become Mm -hmm. Mm three-dimensional. I I don't know how to explain it. It's like, it was like my drawings were flat, but then all of a sudden Mm -hmm. when he would do a draw over, like his, his drawings were living on the page in a real space. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's, that's what I need to figure out is what he does. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, go back late nights, 
figure out how to draw this stuff, uh, Bridgman, Carlos, like all these elements of me just putting all this stuff together, two weeks of nonstop. So if you can imagine that that's how aggressive I was, I was aggressive like that every single night for two weeks straight, right? Come back in the mornings uh, with, with my drawings. I make Xerox copies of my drawings. And then I would go to every director's and producer's desk because I was the first one in there. And I would leave stacks of my work on everybody's desk of my drawings that I did the night before, right? So what a hustle, man. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah. a, that's insane. Well, you know, it's this hunger, right? Like when you have Yeah, nothing, yeah, it's the hunger. Yeah, you got nothing, man. What do you got to lose, right? So I, I would do that for... For every morning i did it for two weeks and then um will minio was um the uh one of the, the the supervising producers directors of one of the shows and this morning i just remember him like really upset in his office right and i was in my cubicle and i'm like oh shit, there's some, something going on <laughs> right but i'm just gonna mind my own business right and i just remember him yelling and screaming in his office he was really upset and I found out that his character designer, he just quit and didn't show up for work and just okay. left the production. Mm -hmm. So if you're mm -hmm. a showrunner or you have that responsibility and somebody just bails on you, oh, man, that's super stressful, you know, because mm -hmm. you have to fill that position. And we're talking about pre-internet, pre-contacts in that way. So all you had back then was like a, a, a phone book. Of content. Yeah, I can't mm -hmm. even imagine. I never even thought about how hard it would be to hire somebody before the internet. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's where Cal Arts, I think, was so great at the time. You know, for all these decades, because it's like, oh, you at least know that you can hire people from this school yeah. from, that's nearby. I never yeah. even considered mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. So you don't, you, you don't even know like who exists out there. You just have your immediate contacts of people you worked with before, and most of those right. guys are already taken, and they're working at other studios. So. He was super upset, uh, to say the least. And I, I remember uh, there was a lot of shuffling going on in his office. And the shuffling was he was trying to find his uh, address slash phone book that he had on his desk. But some fucking kid just kept leaving all his drawings on his desk. <laughs> so his desk was cluttered with all my work, right? Oh, man. And, and he was like going through his stuff and just kind of going through all his papers. And he was like, ah! And then he, he gets one of my, my uh, stacks and he starts going through my drawings, right? And then he's like, the kid. And he tells the, the, the line producer, bring the kid in here, you know? And I just heard the kid, get the kid in here or something like that. And I'm like, okay, Ooh. who else is a kid? Shit, I'm the only one who's fucking 19 in yeah. this building. So I guess he's referring to me, right? And so I'm like, oh, no. And then the line producer comes over. He's like, hey, uh, you know, they want to talk to you, right? And I'm like, oh, no. Like, what did I do, right? And I'm super scared. And I'm like, yes, uh, sir, you know, and this and that. And he's like, he's like, hey, kid. He's like, these are yours, right? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I won't leave your, your desk anymore because I knew he was already upset. And he goes, yeah. no, no, no. He's like, you want to drop? And I'm like, excuse me? He said, do you want a job? Yes or no? And I'm like, yes, I do want a job. He says, great. You're going to start, you, you, you're gonna start uh, doing uh, cleanup. You're going to start doing uh, character designs, some miscellaneous characters, and just help us out with, with every, anything that we need help with. Is that okay? And I'm like, yes, that's, that's okay. <laughs> I walked out of the building, and I didn't live too far uh, from that building. It was in Burbank. Um, I probably li live maybe about eight to 10 blocks away. I, I went out the front door of the building and I mm -hmm. ran home. It's like Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory. <laughs> You're just, mm -hmm. You got the golden ticket. <laughs> That's yeah. what it was. I, I got, got the golden, golden ticket. ticket. I was so happy and excited that I was going like, yeah, yeah. I was screaming down the street like a madman. I was so happy and I was like, yeah, I got a job, right? I was so happy and I get home and then I get a call from production, right? And they call my house and, and then it was the uh, the line producer is like, Eric, he's like, what are you doing at home? We've been looking uh. for you, right? And I'm like, oh, shit. You I'm like, what time is it? it? I'm like, it's three o'clock. And I, I, I was so excited that I left work early that day, I guess, for myself. And I didn't realize I left early. I just thought it was six o'clock yeah. in my head, I guess. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I, 
I just got yeah. the opportunity. I just blew it, right? And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And he's like, no, man. He's like, don't worry about it. They just started laughing at the. You could hear everybody laughing at the other end, right? I was, I'm so sorry. I left. I was just so excited. And then he goes, no, 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 no. He's like, he's like, it's all good. We didn't even talk money. We didn't talk anything. You just left, right? And I was like, oh, we get paid. <laughs> okay, cool, awesome, right? I, I, I didn't even realize that, right? And he's like, uh, is is twenty dollars an hour starting? Is that okay for you? <sighs> 1994 okay. minimum wage is 425 wow. guys yeah that's crazy okay. i was thinking about that i was because um even even without inflation that's yeah, still, still that better than adjusted. minimum wage right now <laughs> it is it is that's yeah great. yeah so 425 is minimum wage and 20 dollars an hour just so you guys get an understanding of where we were as a family financially that was more than Jeez. both of my parents mm -hmm. combined yeah working two jobs mm, each guys yeah. okay so that it's money 40 now like changed the, that's great yeah 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 it, it changed our life changed the paradigm of of everything in in our family mm -hmm. at that point right so not only is this an amazing opportunity but this is a huge opportunity to help the sure. family in a way that just changed everything right for us so i was like yeah Twenty dollars an hour is fine. Um, okay, that's fine. No problem. And I was just in shock, and I was like, "Thank you so much. I love you. <laughs> Bye." <laughs> and he, I was just so. And so, I call my dad, and he's working in the kitchen. You know, he's he's always working in the kitchen, and he's like, "Hey, Mijo, is everything all right?" You know, I'm like, "Yeah, Dad. Um, I, I you know, the, I just got this opportunity, and I, I just got this job at the studio, and 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 they're gonna offer me twenty dollars an hour." And my dad could speak not great English at the time, but he could speak English, right? And we were talking English when we were talking, but he went from like talking English with me to, ¿Cómo que te van a dar $20? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, got, he was like, what are you talking about? Like it was the lottery mm -hmm. for us. It That's was amazing. the lottery, right? And he, he was so happy. I was like, it was just a huge night for us. It was such an amazing night for our family because this was a huge opportunity for us. So in an opportunity like that, I, I, I said, I'm going to give it all. I'm going to be the best I can be, period, right? If somebody's super good, I'm going to be just as good. And I'm going to figure out how to even be better at some point. I just have to like learn this business and I need to learn how to draw and I can't lose this job. So it just meant that I had to mm -hmm. study and learn animation at such an expedited rate that I, I did it. I know at that time, right, certain guys, like whether it's um, guys like Gendy or Craig McCracken, like those guys that were starting off, they were probably uh, maybe Cal Arts yeah. at that time and about to start or, or somewhere in that ballpark, right? So it was like 95. This was all happening. Um, so, so things were happening uh, during that period. But I had to learn like now, yesterday, because if I'm being thrown in the pit, like production, as we all know, yeah. is a beast, right? So you had to be just as good. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about my education at that time was because it was an independent studio and they were just about to turn union and the union wasn't as like sure. on point as it is now, right? Um, it was the kind of job where today you were cleaned up, tomorrow your character designers, the following day your prop designer, the next day your revisionist, then your storyboarding, then you're like, you did it all. It was that kind of studio where every day was just an assignment of something different yeah. and you had to figure out how to do it. And so I, I'm so grateful, right? I guess like now that's like really frowned upon and it's really like, hey, you know what? I don't do that stuff, right? But I, I cannot say that for me, that would have helped me back then because this was my education. So it did help me personally to kind of like have so many different sure. positions yeah. and do all kinds of I jobs because uh, I needed that. Right. So so for for myself, it really helped. And I can see how like now definitely it's not a good thing. Yeah. Right. But at the moment, it was very useful. And so I grinded. I grinded super hard, you know, like learning the system, learning how all that worked um, and and got to work on the X-Men. I got to work on the That's Tick. Super cool. I got to work on Street yeah. Fighter, Darkstalkers. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you know, you got down the, the line of all those 90s kind of early action cartoons. I, I was involved in all that stuff. And 
And, you know, we talk about education here, whereas like, just so you guys know, pre-internet, it was yeah. so hard to get yep. model oh, sheets. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, so your education was like, how do I, how do I get Warner Brothers model sheets from Batman? Yeah. Right. Uh, how do I get model sheets? So what we would do, uh, gargoyles, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so what we would do is um, there was a group of us that we, we became friends at these studios and we would say like, hey, man, do you want to... Um, want to meet up for lunch and be like uh yeah man what do you mm -hmm. have um i got model sheets for uh <laughs> x-men like... what do you got uh i got <laughs> it was like back alley like dealing but you know what's what's funny is that like even with the the early dawn of the internet like i had those moments yeah. where we were like yeah dude i downloaded some pictures of trunks super saiyan trunks from like episodes that haven't even aired of dragon ball and we would just like print out sheets and at recess just like look at them and like trace them and shit like i remember tracing yeah. a drawing of not, not not tracing i was drawing it to be to be fair i was drawing but i was totally just copying a printout of trunks that i had and i had like a group of kids around me they're like whoa he's drawing trunks and i was like yeah, yeah. That's yeah. like those early, so it's like I I think our generation caught the you know that moment now maybe it's not as like yeah we're right on the cusp because I remember when I was in college there wasn't yet like internet like we were just right before what is it 3.0 with social media so it was still like kind of that thing where like yeah. blogs existed but there wasn't social media yet right. and so there were uh resources that were starting to spawn so like the character uh database reference or whatever where you could find model sheets but that was just starting because i remember when we had teachers come into school they would bring the model sheets that they had from when they worked at disney mm. uh, paris right uh and um and they would just be like okay these are the, the model sheets that you're going to be using for this like uh assignment but it was really hard to find um yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally relate to what you're saying is that thing where it's like, you know, it's out there and that the, the, there's only a couple of books. There's just like maybe like animator survival kit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Life yeah. and like Preston Blair. And then it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, it's it's crazy. And, and it was uh, it was crazy because just like it is now. Right. It's like the different kind of um, very competitive thing where. Mm -hmm. these guys didn't a lot of people didn't want to share their knowledge they did yeah that's really yeah they, mm -hmm. they were so insecure about like their jobs and losing their positions to better artists so like Just that's why they, up with them yeah it, it was it was a weird time and i didn't understand that right because again i came at it like very innocently and i didn't I mm -hmm. understand that that why they were being so protective of sharing knowledge and so whenever you did get model sheets from another production, it was just, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Now I get to learn a new style. I get to learn yeah, how yeah. somebody else draws, right? Um, mm -hmm. This is again, pre everybody doing their own sketchbooks and this and that, right? So just having information was gold and yeah. um, uh, no art of books yet. So like this stuff was super valuable. Um, yeah, so then I, from that studio, I actually went to MGM studio where uh, the director that I was working with at Graz went to go work on uh, Robocop, the animated series, right, over at MGM. And because he knew of me and my talent, he was like, oh, I want to bring that kid over, right? So he had the producer reach out to me, right, and and call me up and say like, hey, uh, he's like, I uh, want you to, to call up uh, this kid and bring him in. I want to work with him again, this and that. I get a call and then I go on day one and I knew who the producer was. It was the same guy who actually told me I would never have a career in animation. Damn. Interesting. <laughs> Full circle. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was like, oh my, I was so like, I had a big grin on my face. I said, hello. I never mentioned it. I, I could tell the look on his face was like, wait a second. Right. Did he but, remember you? Yeah. It was that weird thing where it's like, we both didn't say what, you know, we yeah. didn't talk about it, but I was just, I just had this big grin on my face. Oh, I'm like, hey, man, man. <laughs> you remember me? <laughs> I didn't say yeah. that, but I, you know, I knew Redemption. it. Redemption, yeah. It. I didn't have to say it. It was all there and I have the job now. So I was just happy about that. And so I, I went from there and then I, I went to uh, DreamWorks after that when they were just really starting up. And uh, I got offered like a two-year deal to go to DreamWorks. That's when like DreamWorks was hiring everybody in town. 
Very and they cool. were just starting up and it was a big deal, you know, to start working on a lot of the, the, the features and, and TV stuff, everything that they were building back then. So I, I did, um, I started pitching, by the way, at age 19. I started oh, pitching nice. at 19. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was so nervous, like pitching, I was the worst. I would walk in and I would memorize like my pitches, which is the worst advice. Like, don't ever do that. Okay. It- don't ever it's very like, good advice to discourage it. Yeah, it's yes, not a good, not a good idea. Don't memorize your pitches. Just it has to come from you. It has to come from the yeah. heart. Like that's where it comes from. That's where the the stories Absolutely. are. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And but I, I was a robot back then. I was like, hello, uh, you know, my name is Eric. Uh, hey, you let me tell you about this kid. And da 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 da. Right. So they were awful, and all of my first pitches were just uh, you know uh, dumb. You know, uh, what do you say? Uh, just. Mm-hmm. A mess. <laughs> they were a mess. You can kind of like, you even see that on like Shark Tank, you know, where it's like, <laughs> they'll, you can tell who's like rehearsed their pitch down to like every syllable. And it's always like a little stiff. And when they get thrown off, they like don't know how oh, to yeah. like get back, you know, because it's like, you're like, oh, uh, and there's been moments where like they'll freeze up. And it's the same thing because it's like when you have it down that tight, an exec might throw a question in the middle of that. And, and you're like, uh, hold on okay hold on <laughs> like let me get back to that and it's like no nah, man you gotta like you gotta, be ready with answers yeah you have to be ready and so here's the cool thing that happened to me in my career around that time so this is my early 20s so my early 20s um i went to go work for a studio called bkn it was broadcast kids network after that they were like okay we're gonna take uh it was the owner of studio he's like we're gonna take uh, a bun of like whatever's public domain like let's start developing ips off of those right okay and so we're like great so he would just say like uh you know king kong you know do something with that and i'd be like okay and then i'd go off and start developing it and uh so there was like a handful of projects that i was developing at that time and that's where i really kind of got my chops as far as figuring out presentation realizing the importance of presentation yeah. Um, I studied a lot of the old school like animators and how they would present stuff to Walt even back then, like Milk Hall, all those guys, how uh, even the, the, the model sheets that Chuck Jones or Clampett or all those guys would, would put together. I'd be like, that. those are presentations. They're not just model sheets. They're presentations right in my head. So I yeah. studied how presentations were put together. And so the cool thing about that, it actually uh, really launched this development kind of uh, side of me that I loved. I really enjoyed this. And so Mm -hmm. I got pretty good at it to the point where instead of me just doing the presentations and they would go pitch it, they actually started sending me to these pitches to pitch them myself. And the really cool thing was that this studio was mainly an international studio. So they would sell stuff to the European market, to the Asian market, to everybody else. So they started sending me to London. They started selling me to Paris. They started, so I'm 24 years old, dude, and I'm, you know, business class going to Paris and mm-hmm. and going to, like, that's crazy from a dude from, from the neighborhood. All of a sudden now I'm like, you know, flying uh, international and-, and That's doing a five these. year distance. Like that's in five years you went from, from graduating mm-hmm. to, to your first job to that. That's nuts. That's, that's a huge <laughs> leap. Uh, yeah, and and just just a, it's not all talent, guys. It's a lot of it's hustle, and then with a sprinkle of oh, talent, absolutely, you know, yeah. <laughs> so oh all God. you have to do is just stay focused on the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Focus for, on for the sure. day and do your best on that day, and just you know because you yeah. know the industry and you know that this is what you're doing. You can't try to fool yourself, right? So you just say like, I just got to do today, and I got to make today count a hundred percent, right? So. Mm-hmm. that's the attitude and so i just remember during that period i was like oh my gosh i don't know if i'm gonna get back into you know into that spinning cycle again of the the industry and i remember yeah. uh I, I took my portfolio uh disney had a hyperion studio in glendale and i went to go meet a friend for lunch i had taken my portfolio my note back then it pre-internet right you had to walk around with your giant portfolio and you only <laughs> you only had one Right. If, if you had yeah. money, maybe you had two. Right. But we, we only had like one badass portfolio and that was it. And you literally had to walk around with this giant case and mm-hmm. ha- set up your meeting if you're lucky enough, because a lot of times studios like Nickelodeon or, or even Cartoon Network and even Disney would, would just tell you, like, drop it off and we'll get back to you in two to three weeks. 
That's two to three that weeks. Era. Yeah. Two to three weeks without a, that you can't shop your work around. Yeah. That's crazy. I, yeah, that's really crazy. Right? I, so, yeah. yeah. When I, when, before I started at Nick, like a few years before, that was still the way that they were accepting portfolios. And I had to make, I had to mail in uh, a, like a tiny version of that, not the big one, but I had right. to like do printouts, put it in a binder. I like drew on the envelope, like on Nickelodeon. I like dressed it up and I <laughs> yeah. sent it in. Didn't hear back, I think at all, or maybe they sent a letter eventually that was like, sorry. And I was like, right. but it's like, you know, it's like you said, it's like, I'm going to fucking get there one day. <laughs> like it just, yeah. it just lights a fire even more under you. And luckily, I had made friends with a really good, uh, well, back then, we were really tight, um, was uh, Julian Chaney. Uh, he's an amazing designer and animator. And um, he's like, oh, yeah, man, I know uh, Paul uh, Paul Rudish over at um, uh, Cartoon Network. And yeah. Gendy, you know, uh, and him worked on, you know, the, uh, the Samurai Jack and the Clone Wars and all mm -hmm, those things mm -hmm. back then, or even Dexter's Lab, like they go back. But he knew Paul Rudish and I knew who Paul Rudish was. And I was like, oh, dude, you know, Paul. And he's like, yeah, you know, I can give you his number and you can uh, get in touch with him. And I was like, oh, for sure, dude, that would be amazing. I remember reaching out to Paul and just I, I left him a message and I'm like, hey, I'm a friend of Julian's, this and that. And it, he was so awesome because he called me back and I didn't expect him to call me back, but he did call me back. And he's like, hey, man, you know, and he was super nice. He's like, yeah, come by and I'll check out your work. And I was like, awesome. And so I went and I took him my work and he was like, oh, you know, I'm taking my portfolio and he's checking it out. He's like, oh man, you got some really cool stuff in here. He's like, oh, you worked at DreamWorks and this. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm just trying to get into like either Cartoon Network or Disney or any of these other studios right at the time. And he's like, he's like, well, you know what? Come on. And he takes my book um, with him, like big old luggage, right? Things a monster. He takes it with him and I'm following him. And he walks over to somebody's office and it was a, a pretty big office, but in there was Gendy. It was like, uh, like, I mean, every heavy hitter at that time was in that, like they were all just hanging out, like talking shit, whatever. Yeah. They were just having a good time inside this office, all the, the, you know, just hanging out. And I walked in there, I'm like, oh man, I'm in the, 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 you know, the, the Thunderdome of like yeah. uh, amazing <laughs> dudes at Cartoon Network right now, right? And so I walked in there, I'm like, hey, what's up, guys? This and that. And then I opened up my book and they all started like looking through it. I'm like, oh man, this is good stuff, whatever. And I'm just like pretty stoked to be in the room with these yeah. guys, right? And then, uh, and then one of them says, like, hey, man, I heard uh, um, Adam's looking for a designer right now, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever, you know, I'll, I'll talk to whoever. He's like, yeah, maybe we'll hook you up with with uh, Adam. So Adam is Adam Burden, also known as Maxwell Adams, also known as the creator of Billy and Mandy, right? The, mm. the, the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. And so they show my work to to um, to Adam. And Adam's like, yeah, this is cool. Have him take a test. And so I'm like, awesome. I had an opportunity. So I, I went and I took the test. I literally picked it up that day and I turned it in the same day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went home and I just cranked like, and I did extra, extra characters just to show off. Like I wanted this so bad, right? Yeah. So I did the assignment and then I did like a whole slew of a bunch of extra characters and stuff. And I, I turned it in and they were just so impressed and excited about my work. And they were like, yeah, dude, you got a, a job. So that's when I first broke into one of those kinds of studios, right? Uh, the Cartoon mm -hmm. Networks of the world. And I, I loved working at Cartoon Network at that time because everything was going on, you know, Samurai Jack and uh, the Clone Wars and everything else that was happening. Um, you know, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Right, yeah. Too, yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff was, cool stuff was going on. And then I got a call from uh, Nickelodeon and, there, and, and there was uh, Carlos Ramos who was working on the uh, X's at the time. And they're like, hey, man, uh, I heard, you know, you're pretty good at uh, designing and this and that. I'd love for you to do some freelance for us and help us out on some stuff. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I can totally do that on the weekend and, and help you guys out with some work. So I went, checked out the assignment, gave me the assignment over the weekend, boom, knocked out. And I, you know, one of the gifts I have is like, because, again, I had to learn really early is how to mimic. How mm -hmm. to just yeah. clone styles, how to, how to be super versatile, right? So... Whether it was action adventure shows, super cartoony shows, 
like whatever it was, like my brain just goes and functions in a way mm-hmm. where it just can figure it out, right? It, it goes, these are the shapes, Robles. Now just put the nice, pretty lines on top of it, right? It's a good so, skill to have, mm-hmm. yeah. Right? So like you break down, well, my brain just breaks things down into shapes and then it's just like, okay, I get the shapes. Now I could just dress it up. And so I did the, the, the work for him and then I get a call like Monday or Tuesday and he's like, hey, man, um, we'd love for you to come over here and work with us. And I'm like, I'll be honest with you guys. I've been working at Cartoon Network for a few years now, and I love it here. And I really, I'm good. I'm super solid. As much as I would love to go work at Nick, because I've never worked at Nick, I was like, I'm super solid. And I love working with the crew. Uh, Carl Greenblatt was on there back then. Like, I mean, we had so many awesome, like, uh, we had such a great little crew, right? Uh, and so we were all there and I was like, I don't want to leave this crew. I was super happy there. And then, um, they said, uh, well, what, what if you just come by for an interview or not an interview, just a conversation they said. Right. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, cool. You know, I'll just have a conversation, but I know, like, I know what the conversation is going to be about. I know they're going to try to hustle me to try to bring me over. Right. But I'm like, I don't think money can make me go to a place uh, where I'm not like, I, I'm super happy. So why would I leave this? Right. And mm-hmm. so I was like, fine. I went with that in mind, knowing that they're going to try to like convince me. And so they're like, look, we want you here. We want you to work on this show. What would it take? Right. So in my head, I had like an exaggerated number, right? I'm like, for sure, I'm going to throw this out. And they're going to say like, nah, no way. Right. And so I throw out a number and I, I just kind of lean back. I'm like, oh, well, I guess it's not going to work out, right? And so they said, okay, cool. No problem. And I, Damn. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, they shit. They had an even higher number. that they. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, oh, shit. I'm like, oh, shit. And I'm like, okay, well, you know what? Let me think about it because <laughs> I don't know what to do now. Let me think about it and I'll see what's up. And I went back to... Um, you know, uh, Cartoon Network, and I talked to the line producer, and I said, look, here's the situation. They're offering more money to go this. I don't want to go. I love the team. I love the crew. I don't really want to leave. I know I'm not making as much, but I'm totally happy, which means a lot to me, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you just meet me a little halfway so I can at least sleep at night and feel like I made a good call, right? And and I'm doing, I, I did a good call in general, right? And he goes, nope. Damn. Oh my well, God. That's For it. Real? I guess that's. And, and I'm like, how about even just like, I don't know, 10% more, <laughs> like just make me feel like good oh about God. this decision. Right. And then he was like, nope. He goes, you get paid what you get paid. Right. And then I was like, wow. All right. I guess I got to go then. Yeah. Um, what are you gonna Get on do, you for right? trying. I mean, you tried. That's yeah. that sucks. Fuck that. Honestly, even if they had met you at like ten percent, I would have been like, mm, you didn't even try. Yeah, you know? no, they have to know. match whatever you got. Yeah. Over there, they have to match that. That's insane. That's crazy. It's just like, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it was what it was. But look, to be honest yeah. with you, it, it just was meant to be because I, I go went to go work on the X's, and so that's what got me recognized by Fred Seibert right Mm -hmm. from Frederator and his people reached out to me while I was on the axis and said like hey Fred is coming to LA and he wants to meet with you and I'm like oh my god Fred Cyber like this dude's the guy who started Gendy and started like all these people at Cartoon Network and uh, what a cartoon and all these great things right I'm like yeah and even uh, Butch Hartman right he started all those guys and so I'm like yeah I definitely want to meet with Fred so I um, again without getting too into the weeds on story I met with them I had such a great meeting with them because if, and this is advice for anybody who's in development as far as executives. Mm-hmm. Fred Seibert is the kind of person who scouts and looks for talent. Yeah. He doesn't wait for talent to come to him. He's the person who goes out and has people that are constantly like, connect me to all the talent. I want to know everybody in this business. I want to know who's doing what, this and that. And especially around that time, he, he was on a whole hustling thing of like collecting as much talent as he could. So he would personally go out and meet with everybody and say like, like, hey, I'm Fred. You make cartoons. You're super creative. What do you do? This and that. So I met with him. I had such a great lunch with him. And uh, long story short, even though he offered me uh, a short back then, 
because I had such a connection with that lunch and honesty, like, you know, I told him who I was, I told him like what my stories with my family and this and that. And, and he told me about himself that I couldn't just come up with an idea on the fly and say, Hey, here's a sketch. And I think it's going to be a great cartoon. So I told him, honestly, I was like, look, I can come up with a bunch of my sketches and try to make something and try to impress you, but it wouldn't be anything that is true to me. And now that I know you, I can't just pitch you random something. I was like, but if you give me some time to think about it, I can try to come back to you if you still have uh, the program, the shorts program going on. And if it works out, then great. And if it doesn't, then maybe next time, right? And I remember I felt like I just made the worst mistake, right? Because sure. this was my one opportunity to actually like uh, sell a short. And But it also allowed me to kind of just really ask myself, what do I want to make? Right. And that's when I started thinking about like, okay, if I'm going to create a cartoon, it's got to say something and it's got to be something that really means or that's real personal to me. And the greatest times of my life was when I was anywhere from seven to nine years old. Okay. Because at seven, nine years old, I was Saturday morning cartoons. I was going to 7 Elevens to play with my friends. And back then, 7 Elevens had arcades in, or like, a, uh, you know, they had an arcade inside of them. Wherever there's an ATM now, that's where an arcade used to be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this was back then. And so I spent so much time at these places as a latchkey kid, basically, that these were like my fondest memories. And I remember watching the live action uh, Batman and Robin reruns, right? Of, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, they, they'd be walking in with their outfits and tights and they took themselves super serious. Right. And I was like, oh, I used to love that watching that so much. And I, uh, I love, um, you know, again, my childhood and I love everything I grew up watching. So I felt like a fanboy, right? Like I love all of these things. And so I wrote everything down. I love monsters. I love Slurpees at 7-Elevens, right? I love all these things. I wrote everything down that I truly loved and about being a kid and some of the adventures that I would get into as a kid. But now I found a way to kind of take those ideas and now like multiply them by 10, right? And so that's where Fanboy and Chump Chump started coming from, right? And if you think about it, like Batman would always call Robin Chump. He goes, come on, Chump, mm. right? And so that's where I said, Chum Chum, okay, that's it. You know, so I came up with my names that way, but I just was genuinely reaching at a place where I wanted to feel like a kid again. Mm. And so my audience at that time was truly the six to 11 year old, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, there was other great cartoons, the shorts program, Adventure Time came out of that, right? And Adventure Time was its own thing, right? And I truly was the six to 11 in that market. So when Adventure Time ended up going to Cartoon Network, it was a perfect place for that thing to bloom and become what that was. But you also have to think like that was a time where I think it was mainly like your generation guys, where it was like the internet was very fresh and new and you guys were saying whatever you guys wanted. You guys were owning the internet. And because I'm a little older, I was just kind of like, I just want to reach to these little dudes, you know what I mean? The little kids. And that was my cartoon. I wanted a cartoon for kids. So the older kids were watching the adventure times and my audience was all the six to 11 year olds. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what had happened is I had a successful cartoon in family and chum chum where I would go to comic con and it was families and kids galore inside these big like conventions. And then it was awesome because it was like my audience. And then I would go to the uh, like the Adventure Time one and it was all the like teenagers, 20 year olds, college kids, you know. So it was such a mix of like, you know, the targets. Right. And so it made me realize like, oh, man, I did what I was supposed to do in the sense of like hitting that market for kids. And what came out of that was merchandising because there was such a like want for the kid cartoon thing that a lot of merchandise came for family and chum chum um you know the walk around this that nickelodeon was a monster back then it was such a fun place to be um because they really were pushing their their ideas and their you know again the shorts program they were allowing these things to happen in a way that there was 39 shorts that were done imagine that and it was yeah. It was because of Fred. It wasn't because of the internal development back then. It was literally because of Fred. Fred had a deal where he was like, I just want to shotgun blast cartoons. 
And I want a lot of ideas out there and we will play with these ideas and choose which ones are the ones that are going to be cartoons. Whereas now they're like, maybe we'll make one or two and, and we'll put you through the gauntlet of like development. And it's like back then it was Fred was just like, nah, let's just get creators in here and just have them make stuff. Right. So I was very fortunate to be a part of that group in that way. And so, um, yeah, we were the first show, uh, CG show that figured out how to do squash and stretch for CG in a way that nobody was doing back then. Cause before that was Jimmy Neutron, but they didn't know about like how, you know, how to push the rigs in a way that. Yeah. Technology um, just wasn't there. Yeah. It just wasn't there. It just wasn't there. So we were the first ones to really figure it out. Incredibles had probably just come out around that time, but of course they had the money and the budget to figure out how to push their stuff. But as far as TV animation, we were genuinely like the first ones to kind of play with that. And I wanted my cartoons to look like something that came out of a Clampet cartoon or, mm -hmm. um, you know, a Tex Avery cartoon. And so I surrounded myself with guys like Eddie Trigueros and, you know, uh, Tom King and like all these amazing um, uh, guys who knew kind of how to draw in that way. So, yeah, we we, we ended up winning five Emmys on that show and, and creating Damn. like a, a whole yeah. new pipeline for, for Nickelodeon as far as CG animation mm -hmm. goes. And so we did our awesome run on that. And then when that came to an end, uh, because a lot of that during that time, uh, Nickelodeon had changed management again, right? And they started focusing on doing all those uh, DreamWorks properties, right? Mm -hmm. So they got heavily invested and they stopped doing creator driven content and they went all in on DreamWorks properties. And so that's where I think a big fall of kind of what Nickelodeon was started happening during that period. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess we're done with doing original stuff. And I was on my way out when they were like, um, when the development, uh, the new person uh, that started running the studio came to my office and saw that I had a bunch of presentation pieces in my office. Yeah, I remember that. I was getting ready for my next gig. So I was in that headspace of like development, development, development. And so they offered me an overall deal to develop my next show. Mm, nice. Seemed like you were going to ask a question, Gene. No, I just, I remember that was exactly when I met you is I think around that time when I, when I started at Nick and it was, it was so it's like what you, the way you're describing when you walked into that room with Gendy and all the, those big wigs, that was like me. I was, I don't know, 25, but I felt 19. But and, you know, and I was like walking in and I was like, oh, my God, like there was so much stuff like your office was full of so many just cool things and artwork and like and presentation materials. And it, I was like, this is like a showrunner, like this is a showrunner's office. It's like full of all this cool stuff. And I and I and you were showing me these like big, you know, printouts that you were making of like the the uh, what became glitch text and. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And then for there, at one point, I was pitching around a show uh, called Coconuts that fans of mine probably remember. And uh, and I did the same thing where I like printed out like a, yeah. a, a mat for, you know, thing. And uh, and it, I, it's funny because like I thought that that would like be like a cool thing to bring in. And I'm glad I did it. But like everywhere I went, they were like, oh, why don't you just like pull this up on the big TV that we uh, have? And it was like yeah. that time was gone, you know, and I was like, yeah. no, I still have it and I like it. And I put it in my office all the time because it's just a cool piece of art that I commissioned. But um, yeah, it was uh, it, it. The times had changed, but I, I love the. I love the spectacle of it and I love, you know, there's, like digital is great, but when you're trying to get people excited about your ideas, like a big fucking yeah. map board thing is so much cooler than it being a slideshow on a TV. I, like it's I, just I, not the same. I love, yeah, you're right, man. There's a, there's a something about the presentation mm -hmm. that, that needs to be around you for you to understand. Mm -hmm. I, I heard you, um, uh, talk to other people on your, you know, your podcast, how they also had done presentations as well. Right. And put these things together so people can visualize what you're doing and what you're trying to create. And there's nothing like having these amazing pieces around you that really tell the story. And for me as a storyteller, um, I know I've been talking about my journey, but like now getting into the storytelling inside of it, right. For me, that's everything. 
like I, I'm a storyteller. I love getting in there and playing with it, whether it's super silly or whether it's action comedy like Glitch Text, right? And really pushing the action side. That's another thing. Like people thought like I was the cartoony guy and they didn't know my history of me starting off with action adventure shows. So when I was doing Glitch Text, they wanted me to do a super cartoony show. And I was like, I honestly want to make an action show with a lot of heart. Right. So if you see the show, like, you know, Miko has issues with her mom and her family and like high five, you know, doesn't have his dad. His dad's actually locked up in prison. Right. Because I had stories about my uncles being locked up. And so like there's layers to those stories. And I just kind of gravitate towards things that I want to say. But because I'm a fanboy myself, I'm all over the place. I don't have like a thing that I am like, I only do X. And that's what I do. I could talk about being a Latino, my culture of being, you know, growing up in L.A. I can't tell stories about growing up in Mexico and being like just a full hearted Mexican because I'm this crazy mix bag of, right. you know, growing up with uh, pop culture and growing up, uh, you know, with uh, crazy gang environments to uh, figuring out life in, in, in L.A. Like I'm just this weird mixed bag of everything. And so I put that energy and fun into my creations and people either get it or they don't. But at its core, there's always like a layer of true heart and meaning behind everything I do, whether it's fanboy and chump chump, super silly. That's my childhood as a kid growing up as a latchkey kid. Right. Or it's, um, you know, glitch text, which there's a layer of, you know, uh, high five and his family and figuring things out, but also being given an opportunity to be a glitch tech. Are you kidding me? Being an yeah. opportunity. That was my opportunity to get it's into exciting. animation. Right. Mm -hmm. So you put those elements of, of your life into these amazing, fantastic stories. And that's how you're able to have your cake and eat it, too, where it's like you're not just saying, I want to make a cool show about monsters. Right. Before mm -hmm. you, you, you can have that first idea, but then you have to really dig deep and say, like, how do I connect to this story about monsters? Right. How do I connect it and make it something that's real personal and real? And that way, when I pitch it, it's not a surface level pitch. It's something that actually means something to me and I can really relate to it. And if I can relate to it, like in a way that is true to my story and my life, then I can pitch it to you and you can truly feel that there's a connection to these mm. characters as opposed to a surface level, like, you know, pitch or something like this. I wanted to ask you about like the, the process, if, if you're comfortable talking about it, but like when I, when I first met you, like you had a version of glitch text that was very different from what it became. And because of how much you know how many changes were happening at nick and i know how much how many changes there were happening uh it evolved over time and it grew and um i'd love to hear your perspective on on that time like you know the frustrations with that or or do you think it was ultimately a good thing was there something that was like left on the ground floor that you wish had had remained in there that maybe you kind of felt like you had to give up Is, you know talk about that a little bit absolutely i mean look uh, like I started, they wanted a cartoony show. So if you look at my original like art, right, and presentation that I had done for that, it was very cartoony. With every yeah. few months that would go by, I would start slightly tweaking the designs. So there's at least three or four iterations of glitch text design-wise, just even design-wise. And I would mm -hmm. slowly, very slowly, carefully, like start manipulating the designs because I knew I didn't want to make the cartoony version. I wanted something a little bit more realistic, right? In interesting. Interesting. So it, that was it, a conscious it, choice. It, oh, absolutely. Like it was like very sneaky, <laughs> right? And at any point somebody would have called me out, but because we just were doing it in a way that um, the story was growing at the same time. I say we, I mean, Dan Milano, my partner, right? right. Uh, mm -hmm. I brought Dan in. Dan is an amazing writer. So he's able to get my craziness and really kind of like hone it in a way that really kind of allows it to be a cohesive story. Right. Um, and we were able in those early development stages to really start building something that captured um, not only like, you know, my story and, and what we were making, but we were able to do it in a way that still captured that real Ghostbusters uh, you know, that we grew up watching in the 80s kind of vibe. Yeah. 
and um because what that's what that's what our pitch was it's like ghostbusters with video games right and that would get the executives excited but we knew it was going to be way more layered than that um but just to get people excited be like oh you like ghostbusters yeah cool you like video games awesome we're making something like that right but then we had to go and do the real heavy lifting right and so to answer your question we didn't get a lot of like um this isn't one of the drama stories where it's like they didn't want to make it. They didn't know what they were making. They, Nickelodeon was in a really hard place back then and they needed something new. They needed something fresh. So we did get the support and saying like, keep figuring it out, guys. So we were part of the collective, right? So this was a very unique time in, in Nickelodeon's kind of like lifespan where they put a bunch of us on overall deals to figure out what's the best version of a cartoon that we can make and while we were getting paid for it and that's a very unique um thing that happens right and it happened but in a way that we were able to collaborate with everybody so we would have lunches where we would present animatics or scripts to the group of uh, maybe about eight of us and instead of having executives note you we would note ourselves so I would go in there and then you would have like, let's say Gabe Soar, he'd be like, oh, hey man, this is cool, but you're missing X, Y, and Z. Or you would have like, uh, you know, Phil Rinda in there and Phil would be like, oh, this is cool guys, but you know what, you're missing this, this. Uh. So it was all of our creatives kind of like uh, just talking and having conversations like they would maybe at Pixar back in the old days maybe, right? And have these conversations yeah. of, of how we can make it better. That was a cool mm-hmm. moment. And that's when I started at Nick and that's when I got yeah. my short and like, being dropped into that and having that kind of, um, I don't know, that that uh, mentorship was like really helpful. And uh, it, it was just cool to be, to have this group of people like pulling you up. It's it's the opposite of what you described with with your earlier gigs where like the, all the guys that were working like didn't want to give that yeah. knowledge forward. You know, they didn't, they didn't want to pay it forward. Complete opposite. And it was like right off the bat there, uh, when I got my, my pickup for Planet Panic, they were like, we're going to pair you up with Eric Robles and Gabe Soir. And like you guys were like just pointing things out in the boards and, you know, all that. And like it was really it was really helpful. And, and just knowing. And then Donnie was, you know, Donnie was oh, yeah. uh, Donnie McKay- McKaylee, mm-hmm. um, who is a writer and um, has worked on tons of shit um because of that i like met him and we got along and then he was my writing partner on on the on what the show was on the development and um and so it was great it was just a great networking opportunity for me and but also like a good way to to learn and absorb you know and so like nickelodeon's done a lot of things that maybe aren't great but i think that that moment and that's my word it was a moment um, in time, yeah. This it was moment a moment in time. in time where it was like they, I think they had a, a good idea in, in fostering that kind of um, community and like that creative growth. And it's great. It sounds like it was a really fun thing to be a part of too. Like I would love to be a part of something like that. Oh man, it, 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 I definitely, um, I, I cherish that time. I, I remember meeting you, Gene, and you were just like super hungry, man. You're like, I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be the, like, I want to make the greatest cartoon ever kind of vibe. That's <laughs> like, awesome, dude. Like, come on in. And, you know, I've always had, uh, and you know this, like, I've always had an open door policy, man, where it's like, yeah. and so, yeah. So, like, Glitch Techs, uh, we had such amazing support during that production. Megan Casey, which I owe everything to was my EIC was my development at that time. Also Jenna Boyd, uh, you know, in the beginning was a big part of that too. Um, Russell Hicks was a huge supporter of mine back then. Uh, they just wanted to make, they wanted to make something. Mm-hmm. And because I was already, uh, I knew Megan Casey from uh, my family in Chum Chum days, right? She was my EIC on that. Like, Oh wow, yeah that connection was easy. Like it was like, yay, I get to work with my friends again. And yeah, yeah. Megan is the kind of executive where she doesn't definitely want to hinder the, the, the project. She's like, I just don't understand this. Explain it to me. And then be like, okay, here's what's happening. This and that, blah, 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 this and that. And either she'll get it or she doesn't. And if she doesn't get it, she's like, prove it in the board. I still don't get it, right? And you're like, okay, if I can't prove it to you in the board, then I did something wrong and I'll take it out. But she gives well, me other she, other people probably won't get it either. Like it, it's, you know, mm-hmm. the, yep. the layman won't get it either because and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but like it's I it's an interesting topic that it's like 
I think um, a lot of people would, will butt heads with executives and, and say like, well, you're not getting it. And it's like, well, then nobody's going to get it. Like, because you, you have to, and maybe we've talked about this before, but like um, when you're making a show, you have to make it for somebody that honestly, maybe it doesn't even speak English. You know, like you have to make it in a way that people could understand it globally and also not even if they don't understand like the language of animation, because there is a language and there is sort of a um, like you need to understand certain things. And if execs pass stuff through that filter all the time, like they're always like, will this make sense to a mom in Arizona? You know, like it's yeah. like there's like there's that filter. And so it's like if it's not reading and something like Glitch Text is so rooted in like specificity, like, you know, pop culture and video games. And so it's like they're running through that filter and it's up to us to have our ideas come through in a way that's understandable to anybody. And so it's like, it's, to, I always, I've, I've learned to value that kind of input um, because it comes from a place they want to help you. Like they want, oh. you to, they want you yeah. to make them a good show. It makes them look good too. So yeah, I, I've, I've always had that, you know, and again, I, I've said this recently, even to somebody on a text, I was like, executives, don't wake up in the morning saying like, I want to destroy your life. I'm going like, to ruin this show. Yeah, no. I want, like, no, they genuinely think they're helping. And, and they do. A lot of them do. Like Megan always, like we would call her a writer. We would tell her she's a writer because she really would help us out in that way, which she would fill in blanks for us and give us such strong notes that we would be like, you're writing, Megan. Like you're helping us. You're doing our job right here, you know, by giving us these notes because now it's making sense even to us. Uh, mm -hmm. so we're understanding what we're missing. So having those types of executives that are really an asset and contributing in a way that helps you, it, I know they're far and few, right? But they're, they're out there and they really want to help. And even the, the ones who don't help and help your project in that way, again, they're tr really trying to help. So the best thing you can do is have the open communication with them and try to have that back and forth in a way that's not aggressive, in a way that's really understanding because if it's not working, just open yourself. Be like, why isn't this working? Like, why? How, how do we get there so we can get to the A to B the C kind yeah. of this story? And so mm -hmm. because we had that kind of support and they gave us uh, an allotted time to really develop the show, we had done the first um, animatic for Glitch Text that tested with kids. And even though it tested amazingly well, right, Dan and I both knew that it wasn't the best version of the show. So even though we got greenlit and we technically could have used that first pilot to start the series, we both knew that it wasn't the best version of the show. So we went back to square one on Glitch Text and said like, okay, how do we make this better? Because it just, it, uh, High Five just was not likable. You know, I, I think I'm like uh, mm -hmm. the first the first version of Toy Story where Woody wasn't likable. Uh, I felt like High Five was like that where... He was already a glitch tech, and, or glitch tech, and then uh, Miko was a customer, and then he was annoyed that she wouldn't reset, and he had she had to he had to bring her on the adventure, and it just felt like it, it wasn't working and vibing in that way. So we went back and said like, both of them are not glitch techs. They're both gonna figure this out together as friends, and they're gonna figure out the mystery of Hanobi and what's happening in this whole like uh, a story. And we had a full series arc for glitch techs. But at the time, uh, this is before we anybody knew that we we're going to go to uh, Netflix. They were like, "Well, we don't know if those kinds of shows do well." Mm. <laughs> Which, yeah. right? We, we all know now that that's what everybody wants now. But they we do, have, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what we did were called temple episodes, and the temple episodes are the ones that hold the arc up. And then everything in between that are those Saturday morning kind of a monster of the week episodes where, you know, anything can happen and it doesn't mess with the timeline of that series arc. So if you look mm -hmm. at glitch text, we have episodes that are very um, cohesive as far as the arc. And then we have those popcorn episodes that you can just watch and have fun. And so that's how we built that out. But the real version that we want to do was going to be episodic, just like, you know, uh, I mean, uh, with sorry, with the series arc and where every episode was leading to something bigger and the mystery of Hanobi. But we knew that we didn't want to blow up the world in uh, season one. Right. Like and most most people who want to make shows are like, 
and they want to take over the world. And we're like, no. <laughs> Our kids just want to kind of get through the day and save their town and have a cool, like, um, you know, uh, part-time job as uh, glitch techs, right? So we were just having fun with that, knowing that eventually we would unravel the mystery of, like, what's behind this technology and Hanobi and everything that was attached to it. Um, so we treated it in a way that was just kind of, like, really fun and just enjoy kind of the 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 idea of being recruited into such a cool job that if you're like an awesome gamer and Microsoft is like keeping track of you and they're like you know what we need to yeah. recruit this this person like it made you feel like you were special uh it's a wish in that way exactly yeah. right that's the kid wish Great. fulfillment um mm. we had uh there's some questions that were relevant to this that I would love to ask um from at cash cash when it came to making your idea and pitching it, was there anything from your experience with Fanboy that you learned that helped you when creating glitch text? And where should someone start if they want to create a story to pitch? That's great. Um, yeah, not trying to do everything. I, season one of Fanboy was like, I thought I had to prove myself in such a, mm. like, oh man, the pressure of show running uh, can crush you, right? Like, so I felt mm. like I had to know everything. I felt like I had to do everything. And um, it nearly crushed me, you know, in that way. And so I learned by season two to give all that up, right? To give, if the reason I'm hiring a director is because they are amazing directors. The reason I'm hiring a board artist is because they are amazing board artists. Uh, like the people like I had around me, I needed to just give them the freedom to create, which allowed me now as a mature uh, showrunner now, where the reason why I think Glitch text went so well as far as the production team that we got together and the vibe and everything that we had put together was because I had matured from uh, trying to figure it out to now just understanding how this works and it, it, it's a yeah. real collaborative. Uh, it was a very uh, good crew. Like I remember, there was definitely like a buzz around Glitch text at the time. Um, Cause like, and everyone that we knew on the show was always so excited to be contributing. And I think that's the key word is that everyone was contributing, right? Like everyone was, was adding something of themselves to it. And like, um, yeah. And I, I think that's a good way to go. I think, and even when, when I was developing my show, that was always a thing that was tough is because like the execs want to have answers to every question, but I always wanted to leave these gaps in the show so that like the people that I knew I was going to hire could fill them in with their own experiences. And it's like, but it's, it's really tough. Like it's a tough balance to hit when you, it's like, yeah, yeah but what is the show? What, what are all, the, all these characters? And it's like, I am just a, a white dude and I don't have <laughs> yeah. all the, like, I can't, I can't speak to all the experiences that I want all these characters to have, you know? And so that it's, that's to me, that's always been the, the toughest part when pitching stuff is that I want to, allow like well, that's kind of representation where like, like what like, eric was kind of like touching base on is like where is this close to your experience and your heart because even if the characters are going to get more fleshed out later um the heart of the show should be meaningful to some of like yeah. you know like um something very close to your heart or you know yeah well i um, think that like and I, oh, sorry go ahead yeah no, I was just going to say, I think that's more like in that space, oh, no, kind of like how these bit. characters kind of oh, no. <laughs> uh, help, help kind of like shine a light on that, you know, I guess. Yeah. In my case, it was like I worked hard on the on the stuff that I knew I could represent, which was the leads and other things. And nobody kn knows what I'm talking about because it's all in a in a PDF somewhere. But um, but yeah, it's like it's it's basically what i'm saying is it's good to it's good that you included people in in that story and in that process and i think that it showed it showed in the show how much uh influence there was from all the people all the different kinds of people that were working on the show it made the, it more inclusive that show 100 percent, is such a collaborative effort again um you know from the top right of course you know you had uh Dan Milano and myself and Ian Graham. Ian Graham, again, another super talent, right? He had worked on Korra, he had worked on Avatar, he had worked on SpongeBob, like he was so uh, experienced, right? And we, and so we all just really had this amazing uh, thing where we were allowing everybody to be a part of it. So there was that buzz and that excitement on our team because we all felt we were contributing 
and nobody was like, I'm the boss or like, I don't, I don't want that title, man. I just want to be a part of this. So even on glitch text, I didn't feel like I was the boss or those titles, whatever you want to say. I literally was a fan and so excited to be working with these talented people. So I was just there to kind of make sure we're all staying in some kind of lane, right? But for the most part, we were yeah, all yeah. a bunch of kids playing in this amazing sandbox. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just put up the. It's like uh, when you're bowling and you put up the little, <laughs> the little like fences, <laughs> just making sure we don't get a gutter. Yeah. Um, uh, that's all the showrunner really is. I think it's just those bumpers. <laughs> um, uh, from at Dimps Doodles. Uh, Glitch Text and Fanboy are very nerdy shows with lots of references to pop culture. How do you go about creating work that is reverent of those influences uh, while not making it too derivative? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier, right? Like at its core, it really is about something that means something to me, right? And because, uh, like I said earlier again, I grew up with everything, an explosion of cartoons and, and uh, the you know, arcades, video games, right? Like music, you name it. It was all part of my life in such a amazing way that I, I now filter it through my creations and my ideas. Um, can I do something that's like, oh yeah, about, um, you know, the mind culture or, you know, um, my, my Chicano roots, right? Like any of these things? Absolutely. And if I dive into that, it'll be a whole different version of Eric Robles. Sure. And I can, I can do that. Like, that's what I do, right? I'm a storyteller. So I don't like when, when executives or anybody try to corner you as like, you're the cartoony guy, you're the action guy, you're the, 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 you know, whatever it is. Right. I don't like that stuff because I'm not that, that person. I love romantic comedies. I love horror. I love action. I love, you know, you name it. And that's what I love. So all I have to do is switch a gear in my head and say like, what am I writing today? Right. And as soon as I write that, like then the movie in my head, it changes the film. And all of a sudden now I'm doing a horror cartoon or series. All of a sudden I'm doing a romantic comedy because I want to get into that vibe. So then that film changes again, the projector, right? Like there's something new in there. So my creativity is very much like that. So I'm able to filter all these things that have influenced me in my life. But at its core, it's always based off of something that's real meaningful and true to me, which allows me to kind of just dip in and dip mm-hmm. out of all these kind of fun pop culture type things that I do. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it shows. Um, from at Bizarre System, what is your reaction to the sudden influx of fans and memes years after your show was initially canceled? <laughs> I love it so much. I'm sure. Man. 2020, you know, aside from like pandemic craziness was hilariously amazing and beautiful and all the the fuzzy feelings. Now, let's go back for a second to this early conversation we were having about my six to 11 year olds, right? Yeah. Mm. Fanboy was what, 13 years ago ish, right? Yeah. So now go 13 years from being age seven, right? So now we're looking at young 20 some year olds. And now they are 20 some year olds with such nostalgia for something they love watching cartoons and they were laughing their asses off, you know, watching my boys being super silly and all the crazy shit that we did on that show. And so this becomes nostalgia for them. So anybody who was like maybe a teenager or in their 20s when my show came out, they have a whole different kind of uh, things that they were into, right? But this particular group now, have access to the internet like they grew up with the internet they grew up with social media so now the nostalgia is amazing because they get to go back and like really kind of like express um how they felt about growing up watching those cartoons and some of the memes have just uh made me laugh so hard and they've made the the pandemic like seems so like okay I, I know the world is like all upside down out there, but in this little space to see that there was such a love and appreciation for the show in such a way, just yeah, it warms my heart. It just warms my heart, man. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, no, it's it. Uh, that's probably incredible to see that kind of revival. Um, would you ever want to come back to that show, or do you feel like it's in the past? Even if you had, like, if you had the opportunity, would you want to go back, or would you want to keep it in the past? Um. 
you know, there's a, there's a side of me that always wants to go back and hug those kids. And, sure. and what I mean by kids, I mean fanboy and chum chum, because I had so much fun with them, right? Uh, would I want to get stuck there like for a full season or anything like that? Probably not, right? Like I, 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 I did what I did and I had such a fun time with them. But uh, I think if anything, one of the characters that I found out like was super fun during this whole revival thing was Kyle. Kyle, the little wizard kid that, you know, actually was like uh, an actual wizard from Milkweed Academy, went to a public school now, and he's not respected. I, I love his story because he's the underdog of it all. And if I had to go back, I would do like a spinoff series of like Kyle at Milkweed Academy. <laughs> you heard it here first. That's going to that's, uh, <laughs> that's gonna be news. Um we like to ask our guests, as you know, um, about Creative Block and how they deal with it and what it feels like for them. We'd love to hear your answer. Uh, I think th there's an evolution to to my Creative Blocks that I've had throughout the years, but I think uh, a lot of ways that I've deal with it is to, um, I do a lot of running. It's part of like my daily routine is I, I run first thing in the morning. It's the, okay. the, the way I clear my head, the way I fill my, I fill my head with positivity um a lot of that is even like your podcast that i've listened to right like if i'm gonna go out i want to be inspired by stories um from other animators from other people who are going through the same struggles creatively that i'm going through um and and hear their stories so i can be like oh okay right like they're not superhuman right so i'm i'm not feeling like the odd man out in this situation so i have my journeys i have my days right but at the end of the day, I love this thing that we do. So it'll always be there for me. I just need to make sure I take care of myself so I could take care of it. And when I say that, it's like if I take care of myself by listening to, um, you know, I, I listen to certain podcasts that are about positivity and how to better yourself as a human, right? How to survive in this world as a human, how to like how people think, right? Whether it's even masterclass, right? I downloaded that app and then uh, different storytellers, how they go about telling their stories, just understanding how the world works. And when I say the world, the world of creativity works, it helps me kind of like feel a little bit more normal in the sense like, oh, I can relate to that. And I need some space to kind of give myself, whether it's a hike or a workout, but the most um, amazing thing that has happened to me lately is my son. My son is, a, a, he's 12 years old right now, right? So we started the pandemic when he was 10. And like I said earlier, it's the greatest times time. of my life. Yeah, right? It's such a weird time, right? But what I was saying earlier is the greatest times of my life was when I was anywhere from like nine to 11-ish, right? Or something like mm -hmm. this, right? So my kid is at that age. I get to be a kid again because of him. Sure. Everything that he's going through right now, I'm I'm not only like enjoying, but I'm supporting. So he's just like, I want to play video games. I'm like, let's play video games. I want to go, you know, uh, running or uh, skateboarding, or I want to go for a swim, or I want to do something like whatever it is you want to do. I'm like, yes, and let's get into trouble doing it, right? Because that's how I grew up, right? I grew up getting into constant trouble, but in the funnest way, right? So if there's like crazy gutters out in my area that like in near the mountain and they're crazy gutters, I'm like, yo, let's go climb this thing. And then he's like, yeah, dad. I'm like, yeah, I'm the adult. So let's go. And then so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we'll do like crazy stuff like that. And I get to feel like a kid again with him in such yeah. a cool way that it's energized my creativity. And I'm telling you guys, V, Gene, it's, it's done some magic for me in my head, which I think I would have lost it if I didn't have him in my life because there's a lot of things that I've been through in my career that could have totally made me bitter and maybe this angry like person in animation be like, nah, you know, in the industry, da, da, da. but this spark that my son has given me, it's a new ray of creativity and light in my life that allows me right now, like I'm telling you that with a big smile on my face because that's how I feel. I feel so energized by him and, and at this age right now that he's in 
that we literally and and he's got a bunch of kids in the neighborhood that he hangs out with they're all like funny little kids man and and from different cultures and it's awesome because i'm like hey you guys want to go bike riding all right let's go get into some trouble so i'm like the parent who's constantly You're the bad like, influence oh my god but the bad and the worst i mean the the bad yeah. in the best way right like allowing them to be kids and um you know our house my wife and i it's the house where kids come like all the kids come and play video games and they have a oh, home yeah. room for themselves and the it, it's house. awesome yeah yeah and, and you allow that to happen and for me it's just like this energy that it's constantly feeding this this room and my head so i'm always just like okay i'll do that like even after this thing the first thing I'm going to do, I'm like, okay, dude, let's go outside. Let's go get into some trouble. You want to play video games? Whatever, you know, and whatever it is, that's my Sunday. And, and my weekends are very sacred like that, um, right. where, where I allow that to happen. Um, again, prior to him, there was nothing sacred, man. Like I said, I did not sleep throughout my 20s. I was just like work, 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 work. And now this kind of like new uh, work um you know life kind of balance thing is definitely a priority for me so um yeah. knowing that my family really respects my working hours but i will give them my all on the weekends and that's yeah, kind of like yeah. where i'm at well you build mm -hmm. a foundation you know you, you you gotta build that foundation in your 20s or whatever whenever you can whenever you get those opportunities and then like yeah you should like I feel like the people who burn out the hardest and the earliest are the ones who don't make that change soon enough and they keep grinding past the point where they should be. And it's like, once you're in your thirties, like I'm feeling it. It's like, I had to make that change. I had, I, I turned down job offers that I was like, this is gonna make me feel worse about my, more and more like just shitty about my career. And so like, thankfully, like now I'm at a place where I feel like I can preserve that work-life balance or at the very least work on more things that aren't burning me out like they're they're reinvigorating me so it's like it's it's really important to notice when that's happening to you um and make those changes you know be like uh this is i'm starting to like <laughs> starting to lose the spark starting to lose yeah. the fire and having a it's partner tough. or a friend that is there for you right is super yeah. important right so like absolutely my wife um after glitch text uh wrapped up i was uh, you know, I was super crushed because a lot of the how production just got to a halt all of a sudden and new management yeah. make happen. And it was the first time where I really was just like uh, emotionally crushed in such a way that I was like, oh, man, I, I got offered like a overall deal and, and some other stuff that was uh, coming my way. But I, it was the first time in my life that I turned everything down. And I needed I needed to kind of regroup like myself, I was like, I, I kind of lost myself right now. Like, I don't, I don't know where I want to be. Like, I just made the coolest freaking cartoon. <laughs> I yeah. like, I mean, it was amazing. It is amazing. Like, it's, it's just, I, I, I look at it now, like, even as a fan, I'm just like, holy crap, we just made that thing. Right. And I just needed a break. And so, um, I turned down all the job offers, like, like you were just saying, and um, I stopped for the first time in, this was what, two years ago? So like 20, 25 years. In 25 years, it was the first time I just stopped. And I said, I need to just take a break. I'm at a place right now where I could take a, you know, a little time off, right? And, um, and just kind of reassess like my career, my life and everything I want to do. And I think everybody during the pandemic- it, I was that. gonna say, it helped that the we kind of had to right like there was yeah. there was nothing we could do and so that was like the universe telling some of us that were lucky enough to not have to work it's like slow down like just mm -hmm. like we have no choice so just like enjoy this while you can like just simmer down for a little i needed that i needed that reminder because it yeah. was just the same. constant work you know and i but in my case maybe it was lucky because i had just turned 30 and i it's like I had done the grind. I had done the sort of 20s hustle and uh, felt like I was secure. Like I was like, I, yeah. I think I'll I think I'll find a job that I like. But now it's finding the right job. And, you know, That's so it. it's like it was different. That's the key right there. What you said. Right. So the right job. So this is where I, I got to this place. And it was only because of my wife and, and the conversation we had. So after that happened, um i got offered uh, a couple of other gigs right and they were really like awesome gigs but i just was not into them right 
I was like, oh, here's a job. It's a job. And I kept trying to tell myself, like, this is good. I'm going to take this thing because it's good, right? And, you know, we need money in the family, right? We need to eat and all that good stuff, right? But I knew I wasn't going to be happy if I took those jobs, right? And so my wife finally just said, look, she's like, when you're working on Glitch Text or Fanboy, whatever that was, you were, you would come home exhausted, right? Yeah. You would come home completely beat and exhausted, um, stressed, right? But you were happy, right? I could deal with exhausted. I could deal with the stress because of the happy, right? If you take a job where you're stressed and, you know, you're... Um, uh, what did I just say? Uh, you know, s- s- stressed, exhausted, and you're Unhappy. not happy. I'm happy. Oh, right. Right. And if you're not happy, we we can't do that as a family, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's not going to be worth it. And that made me realize, like, if I'm going to do something, I have to be super stoked about it because I will, like I always do, I will give it my all and I will make it the best thing I can make it. Right. So that's all my energy there. So but I also have a family. Right. So if I'm going to do that, she said, if, if you're going to do something, it's got to be worth it. And it's got to be worth it for for all of us. Right. And in that way, where where it's not about the money, it's more about like you being a happy person and loving what you do, because that's the whole reason why we're doing this. Right. And so that allowed me to kind of step back and really assess the kinds of projects I wanted to work on. Which, you know, I've worked my ass off in development these last, uh, you know, two years and which has uh, it's it's now gotten to a place where there's something really exciting coming now and I'm really stoked about it. But it wouldn't have happened if I uh, if I would have just took the job that wasn't right for me, you know what I mean? And now because I've been focused and I've been really honed in on what I wanted to accomplish next like all those pieces are finally starting to align um, because Mm. of that focus. But they're aligning in a way where I have a stupid big grin on my face and I'm excited about this (laughs) next adventure because if everything does go currently, it's probably going to be the hardest thing I've ever worked on, but probably the the coolest thing I've ever uh, like put together in that way. So, you know, it, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of struggle. People see only the good stuff and we talk about the highlights but there's a lot of mental stuff, right? There's a lot of like hard times. There's a lot of emotional stuff. Yeah, but you all, you already answered the next question, which was, what are your plans for the future? And it sounds like you got some really cool stuff cooking up. Yeah, you know, I'm. Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll just mention, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working with Netflix right now, and, uh, and very we'll, cool. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens next, man. But uh, it's it's all pretty exciting. But again. It, it's really sounds cool, but nobody has been living with me for the last two years of like how hard it's been. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's been super hard, right? It's been super hard, mm-hmm. but, uh, but it's only been hard because um, I want to be happy in my creativity and in that space, as opposed to just kind of taking the job that, you know, just is there. I think that's a really, really hard call to make. Honestly, that's something that I'm, uh, I'm really interested in like talking about later too, if we like do an episode too, because I feel like this is, um, I, yeah, it's a very interesting question. It's definitely a very interesting question in terms of like, when do you, when do you say no to a job and when do you take that leap of faith, you know, because yeah, um, my, my, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, when, when we get into those stories another time, like yeah. a majority of my career and these decisions and opportunities are all based off mm. of crazy leaps of faith. At any mm. point, I would have Always. been crushed. Uh, you know, many times I would have been crushed, uh, but I was like, Fuck it. What do I got to lose, man? And and you take these crazy leaps of faith um, because why not? And I never want to live with that regret of feeling yeah. like, you know, mm-hmm. what if I, if, you know, if I would have only done this or taken that opportunity or done this crazy thing, what would have happened? Right. So I, mm-hmm. I don't I don't uh, subscribe to that stuff. I'm, I want to live on that edge, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm excited about not knowing what comes next at the same time, for better, or for worse. But. Uh, what I do know is even in those situations that feel the worst, like, man, we come back super strong, guys. We all come back yeah. super strong. 
and uh, mm -hmm. it makes us like these amazing warriors. Like, you, you know, that's who we are. Animators are warriors, man. We fucking fight for our jobs. We, 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 we learn, we educate ourselves, man. Yeah. And, and we create magic. We're fucking magicians, guys. <laughs> I, always, I always say, yeah, I say that same thing. And I say that our scars are mental instead of physical. <laughs> <laughs> they totally it's are. just, it's just all like, just like awful fucking traumas and scars <laughs> up in, up in there dealing with all this uh that's a great place to end it though uh that's the end of this creative block eric thank you so much for being our guest and sharing your story and thanks to your listeners follow us on twitter it's at creative block creative without the vowels where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask for guests huge thanks to our editor clements for editing the podcast and malik for helping us produce the show if you love our show then support us on patreon becoming a patron gets you early access to interviews as well as bonus episodes click the link in the description of this episode i've been your host gene and that was V. Keep being creative, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Yay.